Hi, in this screencast, we're going to learn about a concept called bioaccumulation and biomagnification. This may be something you heard about in biology, but if not, let's just let's just study it right now. It's certainly an important thing in environmental science. So uh, in the 1940s, uh, the United States developed, uh, at least chemical companies in the United States, developed a type of organophosphate compounds that contained chlorine. Uh, and what they found was that these compounds uh, were very good at killing insects in very small amounts and were not particularly harmful to humans, at least in the amounts they were being used. And one of the main ones they came up with that they were most impressed with was called dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, or DDT. <laughs> now, uh, it, it's, as I said in a previous screen, screencast, it's kind of like, uh, it's fairly related to um, nerve gas. Uh, and uh, it was really effective at killing, especially mosquitoes. Uh, and so uh, basically the United States started using it during World War II to try to prevent soldiers from contracting malaria when they were fighting in areas that had a lot of Anopheles mosquitoes that would transmit that particular pathogen. Now, <clears throat> after the war, people were like, man, this DDT stuff is great. You know, it's so effective at killing insects. Uh, and it doesn't seem to harm people. Uh, so let's just go ahead and, you know, and it definitely, you know, it's vice malaria, but, you know, all kinds of bugs, right? So they started using it all over the world for, you know, malaria prevention, but they also started using it for things like, uh, you know, on their crops, in people's yards, in their homes. It was a very commonly used substance. Now, unfortunately, there were some unintended consequences that happened, and it wasn't immediately obvious, which is often the case in environmental science, right? So we deal with these really complex systems, and stuff happens, we're like, whoops, and then we have to deal with the, you know, we have to figure out, figure out how to mitigate, okay? So basically, uh, this is a pretty unusual one, okay? And you maybe have heard about it because it's, it's, it's legendary, okay? To the point that some people question the authenticity of some of the data, but let's just go with it, okay? So in the 1950s, the World Health Organization, you know, run by the UN, uh, began using DDT in the, in, uh, the uh, I believe it was the, uh, Sarawak, so I believe that is the Malaysian part of Borneo, okay, to reduce, you know, the uh, malaria that was plaguing the people there. Uh, you know, and malaria, I mean, kills a lot, a lot of people. My father had malaria and had it his whole life, okay, but he didn't die, but a lot of people die of it. It's, it's, it's a terrible thing. So, you know what, they came in there and they, they sprayed, you know, the Anopheles mosquitoes with this DDT and they, they brought down, significantly brought down the, the um, number of, of mal new malaria cases. So it was, it was considered to be hugely effective. But then they started noticing things started going wrong in some of these remote villages. Just check this out, okay? So it turns out DDT is not, you know, just a mosquito toxin. It pretty much gets most flying mosquitoes, okay? Uh, and so, but but the flying ones, okay? So what you find is that that uh, when these insects are exposed to it, it's not like they necessarily just fall over dead right away. You know, they, first they get sickened, you know, they, they become lethargic, you know, they're, they're not moving very quickly. Uh, and so what that did is that made them easy prey for geckos, which if you've ever been in uh, tropical places, are these lizards that crawl up the walls. I love them, okay? Now the geckos started pr preferentially eating these mosquitoes that were infected with DDT because they were easier to consume. Well, then the people in the villages noticed like, hey, you know what? The geckos are starting to get, you know, like lethargic themselves, right? So, you know, they're not doing so great. Well, guess what? The cats that lived in their houses and in their village were like, oh, it's a lot easier to catch that gecko than it is to catch that mouse that's running away from me. So they started eating the geckos. Now that they got these cats having convulsions and dying, okay? So that basically their cat population plummeted. Who knew, right? Uh, and you can, you know, you can trace it. Well, so apparently the poison somehow got from mosquitoes. It got into the into the cats, and the cats are dead, right? Well, guess what? The cats hunt rats, rats and mice. Okay, and these rats happen to uh, have uh, uh, plague carry, be carriers of plague. You know, it's on the, the fleas that are on the rats. And so, without the cats to keep the rats out of the houses, the rats moved into people's houses, and now you had just about as many people dying of plague that were dying of malaria, maybe even more. So. It's like, okay, well, we solved one problem and just created another worse problem. You know, that's, that's par for the course, right? I would love to tell you that's where the story ends. It is not because turns out that that DDT didn't just kill the mosquitoes. It also killed wasps. 
And uh, well, the way most wasp species operate is when it's time to reproduce, they lay a single egg in a caterpillar, an insect larva. And then uh, uh, a day or two after it pl plants that egg in there, it hatches and it begins to eat the caterpillar from, uh, alive, right? So it's basically, you know, you're just giving your baby food by putting it directly into this caterpillar. Well, now that there aren't any wasps, the flying insects died. They weren't laying eggs in the caterpillars. You know, so the caterpillars hatch and like, man, cool, no wasps. And they just start eating, right? Well, what do they eat? Well, they eat leaves, right? What do the people in Sarawak, Borneo make their roofs of their houses out of? Leaves. And so basically now they don't have houses anymore. There's this explosion of, of, of um, caterpillars. They can't, they, you know, they got the plague. They, they don't have any cats. <laughs> their, their pet cat died on their pets. You know, now they got holes in their roof. It was terrible. What's the solution? Well, clearly the solution is probably let's stop using DDT, right? But but people weren't thinking that way. Yeah, they didn't understand where, that's what we're going to get to, what was really going on. It took a, another 10 years for people to figure that out. Instead, they're like, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to parachute in cats. Their problem is they don't have enough cats. That's why they have the plague. Uh, so we're going to fix that. So literally, they parachute in 14,000 cats, you know, crates full of cats with parachutes, push them out, down they go. Uh, uh, did that fix the problem? No. All right. But but that was, you know, a solution that people tried. That's not really how we approach environmental problems anymore. But, you know, in, in their defense, people didn't really know back then. OK, but in, in a matter of a decade, it was figured out and it was brought to the world's attention by a woman named Rachel Carson. All right. So it, it so the idea is that the DDT, which at this time was being used all over the world, it, it, it turns out it undergoes a process called bioaccumulation and biomagnification. They're two separate ideas. Well, they're related ideas, but they're, they're not exactly the same thing. We're going to talk about them in just a minute. We're going to, we're, you know, you'll, you'll get it. It's not a hard idea to understand, but it wasn't immediately obvious. So in 1962, this very famous scientist named Rachel Carson, and she actually, she wasn't really like uh, widely regarded in the profession at the time, but she wrote this book. She was so concerned. She wrote this book called Silent Spring. And basically she said, look, our bird species are plummeting. Because one thing the DDT does is when it builds up in 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 the in, in higher order uh, higher trophic levels one of the things is with birds it makes their shells really soft it interferes as a, a endocrine disruptor and it, it interferes with their uh, the the hormones that allow them to make egg shells and so their their eggs were were were, were fracturing and dying so they weren't able to reproduce and so you know, she's like, you know, imagine a world, a, a world where there's there's no birds singing in the springtime because we kill them with the stupid chemicals, uh, and so it really got into the people's um, uh, conscience. You know, the people are like, whoa, this is not a good idea. We need to deal with this, okay? Uh, and they started putting pressure on the government to start putting pressure on these chemical industries to rein this in, especially considering one of the main. Uh, 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 cases was the bald eagle population, which is, a, you know, the Americans love their bald eagles, okay? It's their national symbol. They're beautiful birds. In the state of Washington, where I come from, there's tons of them. But when I grew up, you never saw them. They were almost, they were, they were, they were, they were highly threatened. They weren't almost 60, but they were going that way. And it was because of DDT and because of Rachel Carson, we stopped doing that. All right, so what is bioaccumulation? Bioaccumulation simply is what it sounds like, is bio life accumulation, buildup, right? So it's the buildup of a toxin in a particular organ, organism rather, over the course of its lifetime. All right, so, so you know, you're born, you start bringing in toxins, those toxins don't leave your body. So as you, as you age, you just end up with more and more and more of those toxins accumulating in your body. That is called bioaccumulation. You have been accumulating toxins throughout your lifetime. When you were born, you had almost no mercury in your body. You have quite a bit of it in your body right now. It's accumulating. It is bioaccumulating in your body, okay? Now, in order to bioaccumulate, a toxin must meet two, uh, two um uh, what was I trying to say? It, it, the two things have to be true about it, okay? Uh, it has to be persistent. In other words, it has to last a long time. It can't be something that breaks down very quickly because, you know, if you brought it in your body and then it broke down, you wouldn't still have it in your body, right? So it has to be persistent, like long live, have a long half-life. It also has to be fat soluble. If it's water soluble, just flush out of your system and it won't accumulate. But if it's fat soluble, it works its way into your fats and then it's just with you for life, okay? Uh, so so uh, basically, yeah, an organism brings these things into its body over the course of its lifetime. They come in and they don't leave. So over time, it accumulates in the organisms. That's called bioaccumulation. Now, so the idea is, is you start off with very little, if any, of it in your body. And as you go through life and, and, and grow into adulthood, you end up more and more of it in your life. Uh, that's bioaccumulation. If the toxin broke down quickly, that wouldn't be the case. Okay, but but these are persistent ones. These are ones that have long lifespans, so they, they stay in our bodies. Now, 
Now, listen, bioaccumulation is not like something that humans invented. Right? It, it happened before DDT. So it happens. A common one is uh, there is a toxin uh, called uh, paralytic shellfish poisoning. So there's a toxin that makes that. It's, it's present in these kind of uh, marine algae called dinoflagellates. When there's a lot of them, the water turns a reddish color. So sometimes called a red tide. It happens when water gets warm in the summertime, like in, in, in the United States and other parts of the world. And filter feeding organisms like like clams and 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 and, and uh, mussels and oysters, they tend to bioaccumulate it. Right now, this is not as long of lasting. So so this is not persistent, but it's 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 it lives long enough to make it through a particular season. So it lasts for say, you know, a month or so. Right. So what happens is. When one of these blooms happens, these organisms will start to bioaccumulate that toxin. And if you eat that organism, you'll die because there's so much toxin. It affects nervous systems. And they don't have nervous systems, so it doesn't kill it. central nervous systems. All right? But if you eat one of them, you'll, you, you'll die. It, it's not uncommon for people to die from any of these things. But it's not that persistent, so it doesn't accumulate for, for, for the, the oyster's entire life, just for a few weeks uh, during and after the bloom. Another one that's interesting is these beautiful frogs here, these poison dart frogs that you might have heard of. They're very famous to take pictures. People love these things. They're so colorful and so deadly. So basically, uh, these frogs, if you touch their skin, you'll die. There's, there's that much poison, but they don't they don't uh, make their own poison. This is not an uncommon thing for many uh, organisms to do. What they do instead is they eat an ant, and this ant produces a particular type of toxin, and then that toxin... Uh, accumulates in their body in these glands on their skin, and then therefore, if you eat the frog, you'll die. So you, you know, things just don't eat the frog. They have this conspicuous coloration, saying, "Hey, I'm poisonous. Don't eat me," and it works. But it's stored in these fatty glands, so it's it's fat soluble. Uh, and again, it's not that persistent. So it, you know, if they stop eating these, if you see one of these in a zoo, you can touch them because they haven't been eating those ants. So uh, chances are, if they stopped the last ant they ate was a month ago, it's already deteriorated. That toxin is not that persistent. It's the persistent toxins that are problematic. Now, and it doesn't have to be just toxins. It can also be like, like well, when I say toxin, it doesn't have to be like an organic compound. It can also be heavy metals uh, like lead, cadmium, uh, and, and the main one is mercury. Okay, so a very famous example of this in the 1800s, felt hats were really popular. The way you make felt is you catch beaver furs, and you have to then take that fur and you have to uh, denature the fur a little bit to take some of the proteins off the surface so you can turn it into felt. Uh, and the way you did that was using a compound called methyl mercury. So these people in these factories would work with this methyl mercury. They'd breathe it in, and they'd absorb it through their hands, and people started noticing that over time, the people who worked in hat factories started having a lot of neurologic problems. Uh, you know, involuntary muscles, twitches, and and cognitive problems, behavioral problems. And so they, they came to be known as, as, as insane people. So the, the, the term mad as a hatter became part of the English vernacular. Uh, and that's why, uh, is it Lewis Carroll, I think, who wrote the books? Uh, in Alice in Wonderland, you have the mad hatter. It was because people went crazy because of the, the uh, bioaccumulation of methylmercury. Now let's talk about biomagnification, which is much more of a concern. So biomagnification is the, the increase in the uh, amount of toxin in organisms as you move up the food pyramid from lower level, uh, like, like uh, consumers, like, like, like herbivores. Each time you go up a, a trophic level, you're going to get a big increase because what happens is, all right, let's just say there's just a little bit out there and it gets absorbed by phytoplankton. All right, now a zooplankton eats it and they're going to, and, and now this, is, this happens with, with, with persistent pollutants, right? So, so now these ones, they have a little bit of it in it, but now there's this herring that eats them. And every time it eats one of those, it has that uh, toxin in it. So as it eats more and more and more, it doesn't get rid of the toxins. They build up in its fat. And so as it goes through life, it just gets more and more. It is th This is going to bioaccumulate toxins by eating these, right? But then this is going to get magnified because when the salmon eats the herring, it's going to get all of the all of the toxins that this herring got, and every herring it eats is going to contribute its its um, uh, toxins to it. So so as the salmon goes through its life, it accumulates it at a much 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 greater level than uh, a fish even one step down in trophic level. So that's why biomagnification is so bad. Like as you go up, as you go from here to here, you can have like a, a hundred thousand times increase in the amount of this particular toxin. So what could be absolutely trace amounts in nature, uh, you know, in the ecosystem at large is, is huge uh, to the point of, of killing apex predators. 
Uh, and so this this graphic, I think, gives you a good good sense of it. So in the algae, there's not much of it. And as I go to zooplankton, to a, you know, an, an herbivorous fish, to a carnivorous fish, to an apex predator, I just get a higher and higher and higher concentration of it. And, and since these things don't go away, uh, you know, the, they they're always there, so they're they're going to continue to to grow and grow and grow. Unlike those ones, like the the oyster got from the algae that didn't last very long at all, these persistent ones will stay in an organism. So bioaccumulation means as a, as an organism ages, it just tends to bring in more and more. Biomagnification means as I go from one trophic level to the next, each successive trophic level is basically inheriting all of the toxins in all of the organisms that it ate. So you very quickly end up with an, an alarming level of toxins as you move up the food pyramid. And and often it's, you know, the, the ones at the top are, are, there's fewer of them, all right? So they're more susceptible to extinction. So this is why we almost lost the bald eagle. Speaking of which, okay, so there's a little bit in the environment and it slowly, the DDT slowly builds up as we go up in trophic levels into it, until we had bald eagles and ospreys where I had these huge amounts in there and to the point that they were not able to reproduce anymore. And the answer was stop making these things, okay? Uh, one last one, PCBs also do this. So PCBs are ones that are polychlorinated by phenols. Uh, these ones are, uh, you were like used for electrical production and things like that. Um, sometimes they're manufactured uh, as an accident of, of, of uh, industrial practices, but we have to watch out for them because these things definitely bioaccumulate and they end up like orca whales, where I come from, have an enormous amount of it in there, even though there's tiny amounts of it that are being put into the to the um, the waterways, it, it, it magnifies as it moves up and now orca whales are in trouble as a result of this. Uh, same thing is true with mercury. So, like, I don't know if you know this, but you should really limit the amount of, of uh, say, salmon and tuna uh, and larger fish that you eat because even though there's a small amount of mercury out there, it's basically it's released when we, we burn coal. You know, coal releases tiny amounts of mercury, which, by the way, bioaccumulated in the plants as they grew, right? Uh, and now it goes out into the ocean so that, you know, and there's just a little bit of it in the ocean, not much at all, right? But it gets into the algae, then it gets into the zooplankton, then it gets into the, the herring type fish, then it gets into the next level up. And by the time it gets to people, it's, it's significant enough to cause concern in human beings, right? So, so if you haven't heard this, you've got to be careful about eating wild caught fish. Now, when you eat the ones that are grown in aquaculture, there, there often isn't all these steps in between. You're eating much farther down on the food web, so you're, you're less likely to have this, this um, biomagnification effect happening with aquaculture. So that's one argument in, in favor of that. Now, these compounds we're talking about, they're persistent. Uh, they're carbon compounds, so they're called persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, POPs. All right. And, and these things, basically, they're very durable. So they last for decades and they can travel from one end of the world to the next, right? So they, 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 they just travel all over. So, we, you know, maybe we make them here in, in, in America or in Asia, but they'll travel all the way down to Antarctica. They're, 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 they're all over the planet, right? Because they are so durable, so persistent, right? And they tend to just end up, you know, bio magnifying in, in uh, food webs all over the world. Now, what are the main pops? So the main pops are pesticides like uh, DDT, and there's a number of other ones, aldrin, chlordane, whatever, right? Uh, industrial chemicals like PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, uh, and byproducts like PCBs. You know, there's like an, an accidental product of uh, industrial processes. But, but these ones you see here, these all got listed. Uh, in 1995, the United Nations hosted a thing called the Stockholm Convention, uh, not to be confused with Stockholm Syndrome, okay? The, the Stockholm Convi Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants basically said, look, these are the dirty dozen. These are the 12 pops you know, that, that are causing all the problems in the world's ecosystems. We have to stop making them. And like 125 countries agreed to initially, almost every country in the world has agreed to do so now. There's still a few countries like Pakistan and a few others that will still make DDT and stuff like that. Uh, and so, but, but it's gotten much better and many species have rebounded, but it's still out there. There's still species to get it because these things are so darn durable that even though their levels have gone down, they're still out there. Okay. Thanks for watching.